Hello to everybody. I have a privilege, honor to open the last seminar uh, this semester. The next one will be after summer holidays. And uh, today's speaker is Professor Mikołaj Korzyński. Everybody knows him. However, I would like to remind you that he was a PhD student of uh, Jerzy Lewandowski at the university. He did his PhD thesis in 2008, if I remember well. But I should remember because I was one of the referees, so I remember also the thesis. Next, he spent two years at Max Planck Institute in Golm. Um, with Professor Anderson, then uh, in Vienna, where he was collaborating with Piotr Hruschel, and next in uh, 2012, he came here and he is our colleague in the uh, Center for Theoretical Physics. And today he is going to continue the work of Fermat, namely the propagation of light on curved background. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much for the Światło. Światło. Oh, the Światło. Okay, this should be visible now. Yes, it's better to talk about light without light. Uh, being present too much in the room. So thank you very much for turning up this large numbers. I'll try not to disappoint you. Uh, this talk is based on my longer course I did during the engineering graduate course organized by the uh, Polish Relativity Society, uh, but I tried to squeeze it to a much shorter time. Uh, the topic of the talk is the drift effects in GR. So I'm going to begin with my statement problem. So we have a space time, whatever space time can think of. We've got a source which we at the moment consider a point source of light. We've got an observer. They both follow whatever curves we, unlike curves we, we, we imagine. They may have acceleration but or no acceleration. We know their for velocities at the moment of emission of light and at the moment of observation of light. I assume that they can see each other, which is not an obvious thing in general relativity. Even in very simple cases, it's easy to construct observers who don't see each other. But I assume that they do, meaning that there is at least one multi basic connecting their word lines. Uh, and now this means that the observer uh, registers, uh, he or she using a telescope, registers a, a, a source of light mm -hmm. at a particular position. Now, as time progresses, this position changes. What is the rate of change of this position, depending on the space time and on the kinematics of this situation? Uh, on top of that, we also know that the frequency of light or the uh, or the wavelength of light uh, as observed by the observer is different than the emitted one. So there's the frequency shift usually measured by direction C. What is the rate of change of that? I'm not asking about the momentary position or momentary rate. I'm asking about how they change in time. Uh, so basically, uh, in my talk, I would like to First, tell me how you can calculate these temporal operations of the redshift or, or the position, uh, given the observer and the source in the most general situation possible. So derive the exact formulas for that, which were not known. Uh, what we can learn from these formulas, I think there's very interesting things in, in these formulas, which you can read off from them. And what happens when the drift is close to a cost? Uh, the main third called tool is the bilocal approach to geometric optics in GR. Uh, the idea is that the light propagation effects through the space time will be encoded with special functionals of the curvature along the line of sight. So, uh, obviously, these, these effects depend on the space time geometry, and I, I want to encode this dependence in certain functionals of curvature on the line of sight, plus kinematics, how these things move through the space time. And the main tool will be the geodetic deviation equation of, of the first order. Uh, my original motivation was cosmology, drifts or secular changes of apparent positions of sky and red shoots uh, for objects at all distances. 
they tend to be really small and not at the moment not yet visible, but they may they have a chance to be visible within the next decade. Uh, in particular, it's known since 1990s that the rate of change of redshift encodes the information about the Hubble uh, expansion of the universe. The position drift also probes large scale flows and homogeneities. Uh, there is uh, there is review papers about that. I will not talk much more about the motivation. I'm more interested in how you calculate these quantities in the most general setting. Uh, when I started this topic, I wasn't aware that of the fact that, in fact, all this machinery has more uses than just cosmology. One of less obvious uses is gravitational waves astronomy. And the reason is the following. The gravitational wave detectors, when they work, uh, and let me remind you, there's two types of detectors we know about. There is the interferometric ones with uh, uh, with laser-based interferometers. Uh, we also have radio astronomy called pulsar timing arrays. Both of them, if you think about this work, using the same physical principle. Uh, when you consider light passing from one source to from one place to another, uh, the time of arrival changes a little bit when there is a gravitational wave passing nearby. Uh, this can either cause a slight change of the phase of, of, of a laser, or simply it can change the moment of arrival of a pulse of radio astronomy. Uh, in any case, the response, it turns out that the response of a detector can be encoded, can be related to the redshift. In fact, there have been papers where people approach the general theory of detectors uh, via the redshift. Uh, another obvious place where this whole machinery can be used for gravitational lensing theory, because we know that sources change their position very slowly as both lenses and sources move. Okay, the main problem with the drifts is that potentially a lot of effects may contribute to this drift rate. So there is the time-dependent light aberration effect. The observer may accelerate, and this by itself causes a change of the position of, the, of any source on the sky. There is the relative velocity effect. Obviously, the source and the observer move with respect to each other in the right, in the right of the transverse way. There is a time-dependent Doppler effect, and there is light propagation effect, time-dependent gravitational light bending, which can cause a Point position change, gravitational lensing, variation of gravitational potential, interaction of light with gravitational waves, and whatever else. So, you could, in principle, pick a coordinate system in each case, derive appropriate expression, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, my main problem is that it's difficult to draw any kind of general conclusions if you state the problem this way. And another small one is that the expression you get the problem strong gauge dependent, which makes taking physical uh, conclusions from that a bit difficult. So my idea was to take covariant and derive expressions in terms of kinematical variables, so the four velocities and accelerations, uh, and space-time geometry along the line of sight. So the geometry within this narrow tube around my traditional geodesic. And by geometry, I simply need the Riemann curvature tensor, which encodes the geometry in a covariant way. If you know something called the Zax formalism, then there is something that's Sex problems works more in this way, but it's used for momentary observations, not for data. Uh, and the idea is that these expressions need to be geometric, so exact, automatically taking care of all GR effects, most general possible, so they should be applicable with no restrictions. Uh, expression in terms of kinematical variables and geometry along the line of sight. It means that the complicated dependence on the kinematics is completely separated from the dependence on space time geometry. And it's also a good starting point for various approximation schemes. I assume that we have a point source that geometrical open source, and we are not on a cost. Uh, what I will draw, I will draw your attention to, to very, I think, very interesting physical consequences of these field uh, formulas. In particular, the relation between lensing and the position drift and the redshift drift and position drift which were a bit of a surprise to me, and I'll try to explain them. The main tool is the third or the geodesic division along the null geodesic. Uh, this is the papers I'm referring to. Uh, so I think you explain in that context what calls it means. Uh, I wanted to take a spoon, I forgot to take a spoon from the uh, from the cafeteria. The best way to, to see a cost is to take a spoon and see what happens when you shine light in the spoon. What happens is that light rays focus on a lower 
dimensional uh, manifold, which you see when you as a piece of paper. So it's a situation when you have a family of light rays and they just focus on a lower dimensional. Uh, yeah, as simple as that. So, so for like, example, a focus you have German like space time and the might be just where it's happening. Yes. So you have light rays, a two dimensional family, and some focuses on the lower dimensional. So the simple focus is also there. Yes, it is also possible. But okay, there is a whole complicated theory of what kind of shapes can arise in this case. I will not touch that. I'm just I will just tell you that many things happen when you have this question. Can you show the previous slide of here? Just just to see the papers. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay, so when you want to define the position, there's a fundamental problem. You have to somehow define what do you mean by fixed directions on the sky. And this is not an obvious problem, as astronomers know. So monetary position on the sky is, is a well-defined concept. Uh, we are in geometrical optics approximation. We can imagine a ray from the observer to the emitter. A light shooting rays from the observer to the emitter, not, not vice versa, because from many from conceptual and numerical point of view, this is very often more, uh, more interesting. You take the tangent vector, which defines uh, the direction of light propagation, it's a null vector. Then you construct a spatial vector, so vector orthogonal to the probability of the observer, which points in the same direction and is normalized. You can show that this is basically the formula. And this gives a spatial formula, <laughs> this gives the direction from which the light appears to be coming. But we also need to somehow be able to compare these directions along the different points in this world line. And the problem is that there are many choices possible. Uh, you can make a reasonable assumption. You want to have conserved angles between fixed directions. If you consider two directions from the sky fixed, you would like the angle between them to be fixed. There are two possibilities. One of them is to use the local physics around the observer's world line. For example, you can use a set of gyroscopes to define fixed directions on the observer's sky. If you are familiar with the gravity code, the experiment, the satellite experiment, this is always what they did. Uh, among other things they did, they, they followed um, the look at position of, 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 of a strong of, of a star uh, with respect to a fixed direct fixed directions were given by a gyroscope. But this is not what astronomy uses nowadays. Rather, people prefer to use the positions of distant objects very far away, or fixed quasars. Uh, and that's the standard method of, of defining the non rotating reverse frame astro astrometry. Let me point out that this is not exactly the same thing. From my point of view, the first definition is better in the sense that it's easier to derive. Uh, it, it's sort of self contained, it does not require any reference to anything external, it just uses the physics close to the observer. And I will use the first one. So I choose something called the Fermi Walker transport along the, this, this uh, world line over here. <clears throat> That's something like an updated covariant derivative, which takes into account the fact that our object might be accelerating. For geodesics or for free falling observers, it agrees with the covariant derivative. Uh, it has a number of important but simple physical properties, which in simple words means simply that the angles. Uh, are conserved and that the spatial vectors are also conserved. Well, what is geodesic observer? Sorry? Geodesic, geodesic observer moving along the geodesic or free falling observer. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also show that any other reasonable definition at most differs by, by rotation. So there's a rotation, uh, there's, a, there's a rotation uh, of the whole celestial sphere at a given moment and the derivatives with respect to the the other definition is basically the same as we have here, the, the Fermi Walker based one plus this rotation at most. Uh, you can also take agnostic approach, as, as Rasson and did in his papers 10 years ago, and just consider as the observable the uh, angle between two sources on the sky. In that case, the definition works as well. You can simply calculate the, the variation of the cosine of this angle using the formula over here. So now the trick is to calculate the derivative of, of, of this vector R, defining the direction from which the light is coming 
uh, using the first, first order norm geodesic equation. Okay, geodesic division equation is something like a textbook thing in relativity. So you might be thinking that I'm, I'm showing something trivial, but I think I'm not, because what is really a textbook thing is the, the geodesic division equation around the timeline geodesic. GDE around how geodesic is much less researched. Formally, it's identical, but you will see that the properties are quite different and you have to understand them before you, you approach this problem. It was studied by a couple of authors, but pretty much everybody focuses on a certain subspace of solutions. I will explain this later. And this is unsuitable if you are calculating the drifts. So, just to remind you, so this division equation is, a is, is the following situation you've got a, a, a reference geodesic, and you uh, are interested in the geometry of uh, of a couple of geodesics nearby. So we consider a one parameter family of those geodesics, uh, parameterized by epsilon and lambda as a parameter along each of these geodesics. Uh, this side may be null. Yes, I'm not saying it might be end. At the moment, I, I'm not positive. Uh, you define the tangent vector to each geodesic by basically taking the root of the root respect to lambda, but you can also define displacement, which is the root with respect to this parameter of epsilon. Uh, then you have the commutation relation, you've got the geodesic condition. If you combine them appropriately, you arrive at, uh, at the geodesic deviation equation for this vector psi, which is a second order OD for this vector psi along the geodesic gamma zero. And you can also show that uh, this vector of psi approximates the next geodesic at the leading order. Uh, that's standard things, basically. Uh, the geodesic division equation is a standard, it's a two second order linear OP for four components. The initial data is the initial displacement and the initial derivative of displacement, given the direction of this uh, displaced geodesic. Uh, it's valid in any space time and for any geodesic time, space time now. And now a couple of interesting properties. It has two constants of motions for free. If you multiply the side by the tangent vector, the switch for geodesic, you can easily show that the resulting product is a linear function of lambda. <clears throat> so you get two constants of motion for free, A, which is the free parameter here, and B, which is this thing over here. <clears throat> On top of that, there is some gauge freedom. You're always allowed to add to your solution something proportional to this null vector L, with the proportionality being a linear function. And you recover another solution. The second solution is not really any geodesic, it's just a reparameterized neighboring geodesic, where you a geodesic where you have just slightly altered the way you identify points of this ge geodesic gamma zero and the points of the of the displayed geodesic. So there isn't much physics in here, but you can also formally add a linear function times L. This generates infinitesimal non reparameterization of geodesics without affecting the path of Q gauge. <coughs> and an important point is that this is, in, as long as we're in the geometric of this regime, this is really pure gauge. No observable depends on adding something proportional to L. Another thing is the symplectic property. If you have two solutions of the geodesic deviation equation, you can show that the symplectic form of this form, of, of, of this, uh, form here is always conserved. So there's an, a, a skew symmetric form in way to multiplication two solutions, and it is conserved along the, the geodesic. Uh, you can look at this in the following way. The geodesic division equation can be formulated as a Hamiltonian system, and it has an appropriate symplectic form. But this is not a, a stupid statement. In fact, a very important relation uh, regarding the luminosity distance and a diameter distance valid in, in, in any space time. Uh, basically falls from this property very quickly. And recent result, I just advertised our paper. There's many more of the correlations which fall just from the fact that the symplectic form is uh, is conserved. I will, I will give a talk about this certainly uh, in, at some point. Okay, now I impose additional condition that this geodesic is now and the perturbed geodesics are also now. So the perturbed Condition for the geodesics has this form over here, the derivative of, 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 of this side here times L has to be zero. But recall that we have uh, we have that the, 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 the these two guys are, are constant. Uh, this simply means that this product not the L times L or B has to be equal to zero. So the condition for the perturbed 
So this we know is that P is equal to zero on these two constants of motion, which simply means, in other words, that psi times L is constant. But a, a linear function is constant only if it's constant at any two different points. In other words, the perturbative of is now if and only if the product psi times L is the same at any two different points. This is a kind of, uh, this is a way to impose null condition. And this will be an important technical result later. So please keep it in mind. So if you take the product of your displacement times the tangent vector, and this is the same at two points, the perturbative of geodesic is also null. Now, there is a special case, and this is the case almost everybody is working on. Uh, the case in which the product of this displacement vector and the tangent vector is equal to zero. Uh, I call the orthogonal display of geodesics. Uh, in this case, the initial data is that uh, psi times L at some point is equal to zero and the curve is equal to zero. In that case, this is conserved. This condition is insensitive to the parameterizations. Uh, however, 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 there's something just there's an interesting difference uh, here between the time like case, which you can read in any text, GR textbook, and the null case. In the time like case, you can you can also have formally geodesic deviation equations solutions which don't satisfy the, the condition psi times u equal to zero, u being the tangent vector to your initial geodesic. But you can always always transform a gauge transform. So add something linear here in such a way that after this reparameterization, you got this thing satisfied. So even though there, there is a possibility for, for, for a time component in the division equation, it, 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 there's nothing there, you can always gauge it away. So that's imposing this simply means that you have a bunch of observers and you uh, and you use a appropriately synchronized time in each of these observers. But in the null case, this trick does not work. Uh, you can add whatever you want to your psi, and the product doesn't change, meaning that you cannot gauge away uh, non vanishing product here. And that's a fundamental difference. Uh, this means that there's a physical difference between the, the case when the psi times this is here and when it is not. I will tell you what, what, what it is. Uh, so the thing is, consider, consider you, the, the, the emitter, the, the source, and the observer. Uh, we consider light emitted from some emission point plus uh, in various directions, and we look at the uh, at light mm -hmm. I mean, from the same point but in a different direction. In this case, obviously, psi, psi times L is equal to zero, and you've got uh, and all photons emitted at the same moment satisfy this equation. The same goes for all photons which are observed by the observer at the same moment. <laughs> but if we begin to compare photons emitted at a different moment or photons observed at a different moment, function psi times L equal to zero is violated. So there's a physical difference between solutions in which psi times L is equal to zero, to zero and is not equal to zero. The former corresponds to light emitted basically at the same moment from the observer's world line, whereas if this product is not equal to zero, we're talking about photons emitted at different moments. So unlike this special case, there is a physical difference between solutions for which this is zero and for which this is not zero. Okay. Uh, we look at this equation always in a tetrad. So we, we pick an observer. We find vectors. Uh, one vector, we align one vector with direction of propagation, both R. And we use two transverse special vectors to uh, to parameterize transverse vectors. This is called Sachs uh, frame or, mm -hmm. or spin vectors. Uh, we can calculate the energy just by the observer. But there's a very important observation. It's not that trivial, but, but it's quite important. Now imagine somebody takes a different observer or a different for goals here. Uh, picks the third vector to be again aligned with the direction of location L mm -hmm. and picks whatever vectors EA over here we have. Now it turns out that the transverse vector e, e bar with the vectors used by this bar of server, they're related to, to, the, to the vectors of the unpart of server by a rotation matrix, two dimensional rotation, plus adding something proportional to the null vector L. And we call that that null vector L has no effects in geometrical optics. This is this is this is pure gauge. In other words, 
uh, we may politely ask the other observer to rotate this, these two vectors in such a way that they're completely aligned and the difference is only proportional. It's very interesting and it means that, in a sense, transverse components of vectors, in a certain sense, are uh, frame independent things. I will explain this in a second. So we can consider the vector which gives the apparent position of a photon, a given observer here at a given moment. We we'll basically project uh, a momentary vector x uh, to the constant time claim over here. And you're talking about photon, but do you really mean a single quantum? Or no, just I, 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 I do not know sure this. I do a light ray. Sure. Okay, it can be a light ray. Okay, so I consider a light ray which is orthogonally displaced. This corresponds as, as I use a photon on the same wavefront. Now it turns out that the apparent position on the screen space, uh, if you calculate, uh, if you calculate with respect to one observer and the other, is precisely the same. So for orthogonal displaced photons, but only for those, the, the position on the screen space of orthogonal displaced photons is a Lorentz invariant. And this is a non-trivial statement. It means that even though each of these observers is a physical different screen space, they see the same uh, they see the same components over here and in a sense the same picture. This is this was formulated by Sachs in a very strange way in Sachs shadow theorem. Uh, but it's a quite important thing. It, it, it gives certain Lorentz invariant meaning to many quantities we define like that. Another way to look at that is that we define something called the perpendicular space. We take vectors orthogonal to L, divide the space by L, and this this is this is something like an abstract screen space, screen space which is independent of the observer performs the observation. It turns out that there is a metric defined in this case and you can basically perform whatever experiments defining the position of a light ray in a frame independent way. Okay. The last point here is the Jacobi matrix. So we imagine we've got an observer. The observer sends, this is supposed to represent the light form of the center of this observer. In the curve space time light forms are not very nice and smooth services anymore, They're, but this is possible to identify. We pick a reference in our geodesic and we consider a slightly displaced one. So one sent in a slightly different direction initially. Uh, it turns out that the, and we send it backwards in time. It turns out that the transverse vector can be written down as a matrix DAB times the initial displacement. This DAB satisfies an ordinary differential equation and it's known as the Jacobi matrix. Uh, it has a very important uh, physical, uh, there's a important physical interpretation of this quantity, namely uh, it translates between the transverse displacement over here and the angles on the observer's side. More precisely, if you take the inverse of this D multiplied by this prefactor over here, what you get is the magnification matrix, which physically relates the physical transverse distances to angles on the sky. Okay. So to, sum, to summarize, the geodesic division equation is formally identical to time like cases, but in fact, if you look more carefully, it's very different. There is a special subspace of orthogonal displayed solutions, which corresponds to momentary emission and observation. And this is where we understand the geodesic division equation very well. There is a component around L, which is pure gauge. And there is a lot of algebraic relations and conserved quantities we can, we can use to simplify our problems. OK, so now we can look at our physical situation. We've got a source, which is moving along a word line, and also which is moving along a different word line. We have a one-parameter family of null geodesics which connect them. Uh, and now uh, we parameterize these null geodesics with the observer's proper time because we want to measure all the with the observer's proper time. We've got the null tangent vectors at each point. And now I define the vector x, which is supposed to represent a small variation of these null geodesics with respect to the other. The idea is that in order to calculate the drift, we need to calculate this vector q or find an expression to, uh, for it. Uh, up to adding something proportional to L in terms of the momentary for velocity of the emitter and the observer. 
plus some functions of curvature. How can we show how we can do it? X, which is this violet vector here, has to satisfy the Jodas division equation, null Jodas division equation. Uh, it at the moment, at the point of observation, it has to agree with the four velocity of the line of, of, of the observer because it corresponds to the time flow along the observer's forward line. At the emitter's point, it's supposed to be proportional to the four velocity of the emitter, but not identical. Why? Well, keep in mind that we have to make sure that each of these geodesics remains null. This means that as we slide one endpoint over here, in one way, we have to appropriately slide the, uh, the other endpoint in order to keep the null and the null condition satisfied. So uh, the most we can hope for is to have a proportional here. And on top of that, we have to impose the null condition. Uh, but we have found out that the simplest way to impose the null condition, okay, at the moment, the problem with, with this thing here is that at the moment, this is neither an initial value problem nor a boundary value problem, because we've got, uh, we almost have a boundary value problem with the, uh, with the second order OBE, linear OBE with values on two endpoints, but there is an unknown proportional constant over here, plus null condition. Now we would like to make it a proper boundary value problem. So we use the fact that in order for this geodesic to perturb geodesic to remain null, we need to have this product constant on both ends. If you plug in, it's easy to see that uh, this constant C is supposed to be L times U at the observation point divided by L times U at the emission point. And it's nothing but one over one plus Z where Z is the reg, the moment per reg in the ground server. Uh, and that's not a surprise. This quantity over here, in the sense, represents how the time, the flow time of the emitter is seen by the observer. Now, the redshift in relativity has two meanings. The first meaning is the spectroscopic one. It tells you how the energy of the photon is uh, shifted in the spectrum. But it's also a, a time slowdown factor. If you see a, a source with redshift is equal to one, you not only see uh, all the lines shifted by Towards red, you also see everything slowed down by the factor of two. And that's what this formula tells me. Now, after this simple calculation, we've got a proper boundary bar problem. We know that this vector of the x has to have this value over here, this value over there, plus it has to satisfy this equation. We can find a, try to find a solution. Uh, this is a, this, this way of finding solutions is a little bit tricky. I will show, tell you what it is. So x times l is not equal to zero, so it does not correspond to orthogonal displacement. That's a bit bad. Yeah. You understand the geodesic division equation in the transfer direction a little better. But there's a simple way around that. We write our x as the parallel transport of, of the observer's photos. It implies some kind of d, which is orthogonal to l. In this case, we've got uh, an inhomogeneous geodesic division for this d. With, with some kind of boundary value problem. With some kind of boundary value problem. Now, in the next step, we can use the linearity of the equation over here to solve the boundary value problem first, and then the inhomogeneity problem here. So we write B as M plus phi. M is supposed to solve the inhomogeneous geodesic division equation with this thing over here on the right hand side and the trivial boundary condition. And then we are supposed to add phi, which solves the homogeneous uh, so the division equation, but with more complicated boundary value problem. Now it turns out that this thing here can be uh, this thing here can be solved with the help of the Jacobi matrix formalism. This is the, the solution. Uh, and as for m, the best thing you can do is to note that this vector m is a, is a linear function of the four velocity of the observer. And you can write it down again as uh, some kind of matrix M and U, uh, depending on the position on the geodesic times the initial U all. So a kind of bilocal uh, tensor acting from vectors at O to vectors at the emission point. And again, it's given by a slightly different uh, ordinary differential equation containing the curvature. This thing vanishes in a flat space time, unlike the Jacobi matrix. It's a bit like the Jacobi matrix, but it's not the Jacobi matrix. It vanishes in a flat space time. I would like to tell you what it's supposed to represent. Uh, the bottom line is that in the end, you can write a full equation for the solution for this vector x. Uh, 
which is the main technical difficulty when one wants to calculate the fields. Uh, it doesn't look very enlightening, but in a second, it will, I hope it will become more enlightening. Uh, okay, so we've got the momentary observer position on the observer's mm -hmm. eye as a, as, as a vector of R. We are calculating the Fermi Walker derivative of this with respect to the observer's proper time. Uh, it turns out that this thing can only have transverse components, so we don't have to care about the component along the line of sight or, or along the loop. Uh, we plug in the definition. Uh, right here, we get the derivative of L with respect to X, but that's the same as the derivative of X with respect to L, and that's something for which we have derived an appropriate expression just a moment ago. And this thing here is the derivative of uh, the four velocity of the observer with respect to the four velocity observer, which is just the acceleration or the transverse component of acceleration. And then when you clean everything up, this is the equation you get. The momentary drift rate is uh, this thing over here. It contains the Jacobi, the inverse of the Jacobi map, an interesting combination of the emitters for velocity and the observers for velocity as parallel transported to the machine point. And we take only the transverse part of that. Then there's this n times u, and then there's the transverse observers for velocity. So that's a general formula works in any space time. It does not work in caustics. In caustics, D is not invertible. And this formula doesn't make any sense. Uh, it contains all special general relativity effects. Uh, yeah, and the dependence is via kinematical variables. So momentary for velocity of the observer of the source, uh, the momentary acceleration of the observer, but not the momentary acceleration of the source, the Jacobi matrix, which governs basically the uh, gravitational lensing at this moment, and another uh, functional curvature, which looks a bit like the Jacobi matrix, but it's a bit different. And it vanishes in a flat space time. So it measures curvature. Basis. Okay, now in the next few minutes, I'll try to convince you that this is a very nice formula and you can learn a lot of physics just by looking at this. So as you can see, uh, here everything is multiplied by the magnification matrix in front of then you've got, this multiplies a combination of two terms. One of them is basically the difference of the four velocity between the emitter and the observer. So we take the emitters for velocity. You parallel transport the observers for velocity over here. That's the part over here. You take this combination and only the transverse part of that. Interestingly, you can show that this particular combination is always orthogonal to the null vector L. So it can only have transverse uh, components and the component uh, in the direction of vector L, which is irrelevant. So these two transverse components is the this is what we call the transverse for velocity. Then there is a curvature correction, this term M times U all. And then there's the transverse component of service for acceleration. In a flat space time, it's easy to show that this degenerates into to the inverse of the distance between the observer and the emitter, which then multiplies this for velocity difference. And then there's the acceleration. And if you go to non elasticity, it just simplifies even more. Uh, you've got a distance, but this time the distance is not in the observer's frame. The distance is, is, is variant. You have just the transverse velocity difference between the emitter and the observer. And then going back, you see more and more elasticity effects introduced into, uh, into the drift rate formula. Okay, so let's go step by term by term to this formula because I think it's interesting. The, the term which is, I think, the easiest to interpret is this transverse uh, acceleration of the observer thing. That's the aberration drift. It's, it's, it's a term which does not depend really on the source, it just depends on the position on the observer's sky. And it basically cor corresponds to the uh, drift of aberration. If there is an acceleration, the, the, the observer continues to change in the inertial frame. This causes a uh, uh, conformal transformation of the observer's sky. So basically, objects appear to be moving towards the direction from into which the observer is accelerating. And this is a kind of, kind of like polar flow of the whole sky added to all other events. And, I mean, you could have guessed that this is going to be, it's going to be there. Then there's a very interesting physics contained in this term over here. This is the transverse velocity difference, but the Emitters of servers is multiplied by one over one plus z. 
This obviously slows down the drift rate for redshift sources, but speeds up the transverse drift rate for blue shift sources. So uh, drift rate doesn't just depend on the transverse for most defense, it also depends on the uh, on the emitter's radial velocity. And this is a known special relativity effect whose uh, extreme case is something called the apparent superluminal motions. So we consider uh, uh, the emitters for velocity to be very close to the speed of light and to be directed very much towards the observer with a slight uh, component in the direction x and y. It turns out that in this case, the drift rate can, in a sense, uh, exceed the drift rate for a transverse light form. So we imagine that there is a light point emanating from the uh, from a point here. So there's a bunch of photons traveling along along, uh, along this light here, and for example, it illuminates some kind of gas. You can see that this is called light echo. You can see that the uh, this illuminated portion is growing at some rate. But you can also have a much slower than slower than speed of light uh, object moving towards the observer with a slight velocity over here. It turns out that with appropriate playing with, with, with numbers, this transverse rate of, of, of this thing can be much higher than the transverse rate of uh, of, of, of light. That's called superluminal apparent superluminal motion, and it's observed in fact in, in the jets of in powerful jets of uh, of quasars. Uh, this is M87, and here the apparent velocity is close to 6C. Usually, this is explained a little bit differently, that uh, simply it's the time of arrival effect. Uh, but in, in this formula, it's also present, and it's because of this one over one plus C over here, which amplifies the transverse drift rate if there's a strong blue shift. Then there is the magnification matrix, which multiplies all of that. And that's interesting. It shows a direct link between the uh, len gravitational lensing or the um, how big an object appears, how much it's in use of the form, and the drift rate. In particular, if we are very close to the caustics, uh, the, the amplification of drift rate is possible. So imagine that in a caustic, we know in a caustic, we know that the Jacobi matrix is going to it's, it's approaching zero, it's apparently approaching zero. There's a degenerate direction, which means that the inverse times this direction is basically approaching infinity, which means that if there is an appropriate component in this combination over here, the drift rate may also approach infinity. Uh, recall that the cost is exactly a situation when uh, light and the light rays emitted from one single point begin to cross uh, along a uh, lower dimensional substance. Uh, Okay, so let me show an example of when this happens. We've got uh, some kind of distance light sources we see over here, and we imagine that there is a, a gravitational lens, a, a heavy object right in the middle. It causes the distortion of the image. Uh, some of the images appear as arcs. Uh, these are the images which are simply very close to the, whose position is very close to the lens. Then there is a subspace in which indeed DAB is in fact degenerate, that's the red circle over here, so called the critical curve. And now imagine that in this setting we've got a source which is slowly moving in the transverse direction. And see what happens. Oh, it's a PDF. I see. Okay, sorry. In this case, I cannot show you. What happens simply is that uh, the drift rate speeds up very quickly when uh, when it almost touches this, this critical curve. In this case, what happens is that this source becomes very strongly uh, elongated in one direction and also speeds up. And this is exactly because in this case, both uh, the magnification matrix goes out of one in one direction. I find this very interesting for the following reason. Uh, it turns out that in strong lens systems, uh, it is possible uh, it turns out that it's possible to see very, very strange things. Uh, in one strong lens in galaxy cluster, with a strong lens spectrum galaxy, uh, a group of astronomers managed to notice uh, for, for a couple of years the image of a single star, and even a possible counter image on the other side, of a galaxy of z equal to 1.49. 
Now, seeing an image of a single star in located that far away is absolutely impossible unless it happens to be very close to a critical curve, which adds an, a, an additional magnification estimated to be 2,000. Now, if the image can be magnified 2,000 times, and this is due to the uh, to elongation of the image in one particular direction, but it's, it's not possible to be to resolve something like that. But if the image is, uh, can be elongated 2,000 times, it also that means that any type of transverse motions can also be amplified 2,000 times. So we can provide the sun sources. Uh, when you have strong density, it could be possible to amplify the transverse motions. Uh, and I think this could be an ideal in a future direction of research. So if we're lucky, drifts may get amplified by three orders of magnitude with strong density systems. Caustics are very good transverse motion amplifiers. Okay, and the last term I wanted to talk about is this M term. It took me some time to understand what it actually means. It's very much a general relativity effect that a term like this appears over here. Uh, and I, but I think I didn't manage to figure out what this is meaning of that. So GR is a curvature effect. If, if there is no curvature, there is no M. It's, it's uh, a geometrical way to look at this term is that it's the difference between the parallel transport and the transport. We take a vector parallel transport to the emission point, but we can also take now geodesics, which are initially uh, parallel to, the, to, to this one, and drag the spectral field along these geodesics. In a curved space, I'm not quite did the same thing, and this difference is exactly one. That's not a very physical definition, but after some time, I managed to see what exactly M calls M and calls the violation of the large symmetry in the curved space time. How? Well, I, I will explain in, in a second. So consider a flat space time with no and source and the and the emitter with no accelerations, just moving through the space time. And we can't, we're calculating the drift rate. It's given by one over the distance in the observer spring times this uh, transverse for velocity difference. Now imagine we boost both both of the observer and the and the emitters for velocity by the same uh, by the same type of boost. Lambda means a Lorentz matrix. Uh, are we going to recover the same drift rate? Question to everybody. So we've got a source moving the drift. We've got a source and observer. They are moving with respect to each other. We are in the cost of state time. We boost both of them. Is the drift rate conserved or not? I guess no. The deal was. No, it's not. It's not because the, the, the distance between the source and the observer is uh, Lorentz dependent. Mm -hmm. And changes with the boost, but we can we can take very special type of boost, maybe something called can take lambda to be a number of there's an element just to prove or the parabolic subgroup of the Lorentz. <laughs> so a special uh, Lorentz transform which conserves this null vector L these guys. It turns out that these special boosts conserve the the this situation and also conserve the distance between O and P. These are basically transverse boosts plus a bit of rotation plus a bit of boost with respect to Z, but it's mainly, you can think of them as trans boosting the transverse directions plus small corrections. Uh, it turns out that in this case, the drift rate is invariant. Okay, uh, and that makes sense because the obviously with the space time, there's no absolute motions in, in Minkowski space. Uh, so boosting both the observer and the source simultaneously by the same amount should not change the drift rate. And it does not happen. This is what happens if you also make sure that the distance between these two guys is conserved. But if we do it in the first space times with no acceleration, something different happens. Well, we can still apply this formally. But what happens is that M, note that M is multiplied only by the observer's focus. It's not a relative motion. So M introduces the observer on the observer's for velocity, not, not the relative velocity. And basically, in the general situation, the drift rate would not be conserved even if we boost both of them by uh, a parabolic subgroup boost. So M measures the curvature used to lower the symmetry violation. In the current space time, we should not expect this type of bilocals uh, lower the symmetry. 
it's not surprising. Think about standard gravitational lens. You've got a heavy body somewhere between the source and the and your server. And this body obviously has its own rest. And it's pretty obvious that the situation with, with drift will be different depending on the velocity on the, on the velocity of the observer with respect to the lens. So the, apart from the velocity of the emitter and the observer, there should be a dependence on the velocity of the lens and enters via this M over here. So M measures the large symmetry violation. Uh, it also plays an interesting role if you have uh, observers in gravitational bound systems. So when you look at the gravitational bound system, you might become a little bit suspicious of this formula because it contains only the non-gravitational transverse acceleration. There is no gravitational acceleration here. If there is no gravitational acceleration, there is no acceleration term. And I think that uh, for, for the observer which is accelerated in the gravitational field, but not otherwise, there will be no uh, aberration limit. Right, because in this case W is equal to zero, and there is no aberration drift term. But we know that there is an annual aberration of the Earth, even though it's in the free fall. So it seems to be a bit of a contradiction. Uh, there isn't any if you do your calculations correctly. So you consider an observer in a finite potential well, or between, for example, a body and a source very far away. Uh, I also assume static potential and by vanishing outside some mm -hmm. Some kind of radius, I assume it's sort of far away. What you can show is that this M term, uh, you can calculate the M term, you plug in everything here, and the M term produces a term proportional to the transverse uh, derivative of phi, the gravitational potential, at the observation point, multiplied by minus U O. And this is in the internal approximation, nothing else but the gravitational acceleration of this guy over here in the uh, uh, in this gravitational field, meaning that M saves the day uh, and adds the aberration drift from the gravitational acceleration to the total acceleration. So even your body is in a free fall, but it's accelerated with respect to the uh, because of motion in the, the gravitational field, this effect is there, but it's contained in M. Okay. Now, okay. So, just a few words. Uh, has anybody measured anything like this? Well, for cosmological distances, the drift is a sum of cosmological systems. The cosmological signal, the transverse motion, and the local kinematics. And you can perform a multiple decomposition of this, of this signal. The local kinematics is, is dominated by the acceleration of the solar system with respect to the galaxy. So uh, the whole solar system is accelerating, and this corresponds to a drift rate of like, the present whole sky of the order of four micro seconds per year. Then we've got the transverse motion of the solar system, which Produces a parallax effect as well, 78 astronomical units per year. Uh, and there's 10 to minus 10, 10 to minus 1 micro seconds per year for objects at distance of uh, one tenth of the rate. And on top of that, you've got the transverse motions of the sources, which, which produces a noise on top of all of that. Uh, let me advertise another paper for us. Uh, with Asta Heinesen, we approached the problem of redshift and position drifts in a non-isotropic uh, situation when uh, locally we do not assume the Hubble fault to be isotropic. And we basically considered what kind of data you can draw from, from, from this type of observations. Uh, what people managed to observe so far is only the secular aberration drift from the uh, motion of the solar system from the exertion of the solar system. It was first done using radio astronomy and data from 20 years, basically positions of 555 uh, strong radio sources using VLBI radio astronomy, and they managed to note uh, the general dipole uh, corresponding exactly to the position drift. Then there is the, there was another pretty similar uh, measurement performed using Again, the LPI and data from even longer period resulting in a slightly different uh, estimate, but also roughly pointing to the 
position of the center of the galaxy. And then Gaia, the last decade, uh, performed the optical counterpart and also found fairly similar dipole on the sky, dipole deformation of the sky because of the probably because of the acceleration of the solar system with respect to the, the galactic center. So this this inelectable effect is the only one that has been observed so far. Uh, on top of that, uh, there was a bound on the optical, which, which which can be related to the gravitational wave background. Okay, we we'll won't talk much about that. Okay, so position group equation summary. Uh, it relates the lensing position group. It involves the transverse velocity the difference, but also at a sort of absolute velocity term present only if there is a curvature term, and contains an aberration group for non geodesic observers. It's hard for me. So I think we can have just questions. Yeah. Some of, the, of those uh, funny effects related with caustics you may observe when using curved mirror, for instance. Okay. You can look looking at the bottom of the swimming pool. <laughs> That's wrong. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, you assumed from the very beginning that your source is producing co coherent light. Yes. There is this study of Emmy Wolf showing that if you account for incoherence, then even even in Koski space, mm -hmm. there would be some drift, some shift of the of the frequency. Uh, what do you think would be the impact of this partial coherence or incoherence of the source on your uh, studies? So I read this paper <laughs> once or twice, and in my opinion, it was depend very much on the details of how the that what? Way. It will depend on the details of the measurement is made also. Yes. Uh, I'm very much doing instrumental work. I, I can imagine that. Okay, this is done differently in different situations. In the DLDI measurements, what they do is they basically filter an appropriate frequency and then compare the phases from, 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 from different telescopes. In that case, this non coherence. So, so but by, the, the, by the spectrum of light, whatever the uh, instrument that you are using is always basically computing the Fourier transform of a correlation function. Yes. Right? And that one, of course, depends on the coherence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and this. Okay, so so I think the answer is that it depends on the way you perform measurements. But I think to that yeah. Mm -hmm. We have um, we have online for me for the online participants question online online question from online. online ah okay okay who is ah Wojtek Helvig go ahead Wojtek ask your question oh he just typed the if you type the question maybe you could uh, if you if your formalism and especially redshift drift to be used to constrain major potential uh, WEP breaking, WEP breaking. Sorry. So weak equivalence principle. Uh, weak equivalence principle breaking. Uh, never thought about that. Uh, so my my formalism assumes that GR works as simple as, as simple as that, or that at least light travels through uh, along algebraic basis. I never thought about measuring particular post waves of generality using this this method. To be honest, maybe it can be. I, I never thought about that. In non GR theory, we have a uh, scalar field. Okay, so, so what happens in non GR theories? In non GR the theories, typically you have you have two metrics. One of them is the one that 
sort of matrices. Another one is the metric which I'm talking to the Einstein equations. Uh, so I just assume that light travels along null geodesics of, of this matter of the metric, uh, the matrices. In that case, you can apply it. If not, then you would have to modify it. Okay. Uh, can it be used to distinguish between these theories? And I don't know. I never thought about it. Okay, any other question from the audience? If no, we thank again. <laughs> And see you within three months after our convention.